Um, hello everyone, I'm Izzy. I'm currently studying my Masters at the University of York and I'll be talking to you today about uh, Beyond the Functional Palimpsestive Memory and the Significance of Place in the Middle Paleolithic Occupations. Um, so just a quick overview of what I'm going to be talking about um, to give you a bit of context basically. So um, this presentation will focus on intracyte patterns in particular, um, but I'll first contextualise this uh, more broadly in, with regard to place in the Paleolithic, um, then talk about previous research into intracyte <coughs> patterns, um, then intracyte pattern formation, how palimpsests of memory contribute to this, um, and then potential archaeological evidence we can look at for palimpsests of memory. Um, and then summarise with the potential I see in intracyte patterns as a body of evidence. So place in the middle Paleolithic um, occurs in quite dynamic landscapes uh, very frequently. Now, of course, there's some preservation bias. We might not get open air sites as frequently as we do um, rock shelters or cave sites, but the mere presence of occupations in these dynamic landscapes um, is significant. Oh, someone's phone going off. <laughs> um, and as hominins, we were attracted to these dynamic landscapes. And certainly in the uh, Middle Paleolithic, these would have been much more prominent. You're surrounded in a stark, icy landscape, and you see these great, big, huge uh, gorges, in the case of Creswell Crags, um, which really stand out and are significant to you personally. But it's not just visually as well. Migrating animals are also attracted to areas like this. And so you can see that it's also a strategic and subsistence, subsistence area um, for hominids in this, er in this uh, time. So it's kind of unsurprising that we find that um, these areas are densely occupa occupied, uh, occupied, occupied, um, <laughs> and they seem to be very similar in their uh, natural formation. So recent research that explores the significance of these landscapes um, talks more about the landscapes as a whole and not really focuses on the sites that occur within these landscapes. Um, and also discusses it in context of mobility, which is kind of unsurprising. Um, so it's thought that Neanderthal mobility is focused within small ranges. They are mobile, but they kind of cycle within these uh, dynamic landscapes. So they would be continuously returning to the same places um, and are kind of attached in some way to these prominent landscapes. And in hunter-gatherer analogies um, of the contemporary, we see that when this occurs, this behaviour of kind of cyclical um, mobility, you develop oral histories and traditions that are specifically associated to these areas. Now, how might me, white might we, as archaeologists, um, access these uh, cultural behaviours that occur that are occurring within these significant landscapes? And I'm proposing here that intracyte patterns may enable um, us to access this and actually also have some agency in reinforcing uh, socio-cultural behaviours. <coughs> so to give a bit of background into intracyte patterns and why I feel they've been overlooked as a body of evidence, so they seem to um, be assumed that in the, uh, the Middle Paleolithic, Neanderthals kind of lack this capability of um, organizing their space in a significant manner uh, with you know, the association in Pettit's 1997 paper of uh, Neanderthal intracyte patterns to hyenas. So there's really this um, lack of kind of consideration of the potential social and cultural behaviours that are occurring in these sites. Um, so there's the argument that structures are not present, they do not care for their uh, sites and they're just kind of subsistence activities that are occurring. And this kind of leads to the adoption of models such as, such as Binford's toss and drop model developed from Nunamiat uh, societies um, that suggests that there's a very uh, simplistic behaviour occurring, you know, you're, you're dropping smaller items and you're tossing the larger items and that's all that's occurring at this site. What information does this actually provide us with? You know, we're lacking <coughs> the um, 
the drive, the motivation to access the social cultural uh, phenomena. Um, and these assumptions tend to not look at the available evidence. This is not a question of the evidence isn't out there because of preservation or whatever. It's merely people aren't looking. And a key example I found of this is Klein in 1973, his Ice Age Hunters uh, book, proposed that Middle Paleolithic occupations had structures and they're common and we should expect them to be common. However, Gamble in 1999 then stated that Middle Paleolithic occupations had no structures. So it's this um, assumption that kind of drives <coughs> through in the literature, which kind of influences us and makes us, you know, assume the same, that we can't look at intracite patterns as a body of evidence for complex behaviours. But more recent research has begun to challenge this. Um, there's been the application of ethnography um, by Hayden, for example, where he looks at uh, sleeping arrangements at sites using ethnography to support this um, and proposes relationships um, and group size in the middle, middle Paleolithic. And also we get the high, uh, study of high resolution sites such as Abrik Romani, uh, where we have excellent preservation of the spatial organization so we can begin to access the socio-cultural. However, when it comes to significance of place in particular, this still focuses on inter-site patterns, so the use of landscape, rather than the use of sites. But I feel that in intra-site pattern formation, actually the significance of place um, and cultural memory comes through in a, a certain uh, number of levels. So in the first level of spatial organisation, I just want to preface this with spatial organisation is not random. Um, it's been shown in a number of psychological studies that we consciously and subconsciously think about where we uh, place things in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, and this is, of course, influenced by our own cultural experiences. So we can therefore look at the accumulation of functional, social and cultural behaviours. And specifically in this talk, I want to focus on the cultural so um, specific cultural phenomena influencing cosmological, uh, based, influenced by cosmological beliefs um, and potentially cultural memory coming through in intracite patterns. But then we have behavioural interference coming in. So you have your initial behaviours, another group returns to that site. If we remember, people are con continuously returning to the same sites. So you're going to have interference of this initial behaviours. Now, Dibble et al, a uh, recent paper, um, suggests that this is a fallacy, and this means that we cannot use this as evidence. So this disturbance of uh, behaviours, of the initial behaviour, means that we can't understand anything going on here. And I want to challenge this because surely the behavioural interference is just as valid as the initial behaviours. Um, we can't expect to have perfectly preserved uh, one occupation um, of behaviour. And it's this interaction that is actually quite interesting in repeated occupations. So um, as previously mentioned in the last talk, the formation of palimpsest um, demonstrates this interaction with previous behaviours. We have layers of different occupations and layers of engagement. And this can manifest itself in different ways. And finally, a little nod to taphonomic processes. Again, this is usually um, construed as being a negative uh, when we come to looking at intracite patterns. Taphonomic processes are evil and they destroy everything we want to look at. But actually, if they are wholly destructive, we have nothing there to look at, so we don't look at it. Um, <laughs> and where we do have taphonomic processes um, occurring, we can usually model these and understand what processes have took place and then kind of work backwards to understand the integrity of assemblages. So palimpsests of memory. Um, hopefully that's just demonstrated that intracite patterns are important and are significant as a body of evidence. I'm proposing that palimpsests of memory occur when hominins interact with previous behaviours at a site. So if we imagine one group's come in, they've organised their space, 
they've left, they've moved on. Another group, uh, or perhaps the same group later, returns to that space and they observe these behaviours that have already occurred. So there's evidence of hearths, there's perhaps some lithic remains. Um, and it's this engagement and how they then behave according to this initial behaviour and how these initial uh, behaviours shape their current behaviours, which is interesting um, and I propose is a palimpsest of memory. And this kind of relates the two um, behaviours occurring at both the spatial organisation and the behavioural interference. So it explicitly concerns the sociocultural and therefore is interesting for us to access that. So just to kind of put this into diagram form, which is always nice, you have your initial occupation and this occurs concerns uh, initial behaviours informing spatial organisation. This is repeated within that occupation and you get an intracite pattern. Exciting. Then a new group comes in and they observe this previous intracite pattern. And now I'm proposing, and you can critique this as much as you like in the discussion, that they either respect or repeat the behaviours that occur there. So in the respect category, apologies for my crude diagram, you have the X's marking different occupations. And so someone comes in, they see someone has already occupied the space, they occupy a different space. Or you have repeat. So they come in, they see people have occupied the space, and they, mod, uh, they change their behaviour to repeat the same behaviours that had previously occurred. And this is kind of what um, palimpsest of memory concern. So it's this repetition of certain behaviours occurring at a site. Um, and I believe that it's when um, the initial intracite patterns reflect the pathway that people would have, would usually, uh, sorry, the life way that people would usually adopt at sites that makes this more likely. So if you would usually organise your space in the way that it's previously organised, why not just organise it in the same way? It makes things a bit simpler. And then the nuance in this is that this reinforces cultural behaviours. So you're changing your behaviour to repeat what, what's already occurred, and this reinforces the previous cultural behaviours and perhaps influences your own cultural behaviours. So um, conceptually, archaeological evidence um, of this needs to kind of transcend uh, temporal issues with temporality of behaviours. Um, and what I mean by this is that the behaviours have to be relational to one another when we're looking at evidence, rather than being reliant on dating completely. So this is why I'm not looking at the respect area, because we don't know how those separate interactions, uh, separate behaviours um, interact with one another. Whereas repeated palimpsest one on top of another, it's quite easy, easy to discern which came first, which followed. Um, so for example, uh, archaeological evidence of this may mani manifest itself um, as structures that have been intended to be disassembled and reconstructed, repatternation on lithic tools, and there's really interesting studies occurring at Lacotte de saint brelard currently on this exact topic. <coughs> um, and then the repetition of specific behaviours, specific cultural behaviours in this case, across a site. So to use a couple of case studies, so it's not just all conceptual here, and I'm trying to ground it in the archaeology. Um, Brunacal Cave is absolutely phenomenal. Um, I recommend looking it up if you haven't heard of it already. Um, so it dates to around 176,000 years ago. Um, and it's these structures are produced by breaking stalagmites and then organisation. So this is... Uh, very interesting Neanderthal behaviours occurring. Um, and hopefully, as you can see here, there's different structures that are present. So we have structure A, structure B, uh, structure C, D, E and F. And they seem to be um, repeating this behaviour and kind of building upon existing behaviours. So as you can probably imagine, um, it's not easy to break stalagmites. 
Um, and therefore, it's expected that this, this uh, pattern observed here would have accumulated over a long period of time. Um, so we might expect that different groups are coming in, observing what's already took place and kind of building upon this. Now, as this serves no apparent functional uh, purpose, we might expect, therefore, that this is a specific cultural behaviour that we're observing. And therefore, the new groups coming in and building upon this cultural behaviour are reinforcing this um, socio-cultural behaviour of the previous groups. And it's um, then developing and coming through in multiple generations or multiple different groups within the area. Similarly, but not that obviously similarly, um, we have Moldova and uh, these wonderful mammoth bone structures that date back to around 60,000 years ago. Um, now it's apparent uh, that we have repeated occupation here. So as you can see, there's a lot of activity happening across the site. There's evidence of multiple halves occurring within um, the structure, which is this. I'm just highlighting it because it's not that clear on the screen. Um, so that's the proposed mammoth hut structure. And we have different halves occurring within this structure. Um, so that suggests multiple occupation of the same uh, hut. Um, and this potentially, therefore, represents deconstruction and reconstruction of the structure. So it's not expected that this would be present the entire time people leave and return to the site. And perhaps if you come into the site and you see this kind of um, deconstructed hut, you might just utilize the materials that are already there and reconstruct it. And that process is again, reinforcing cultural behaviors within the society. We also have interestingly, red ochre associated to this hut. Um, which suggests a kind of symbolic use of this site, um, which kind of uh, nicely uh, supports the <coughs> idea, thank you, um, that this is a significant sociocultural behaviour occurring. And the particular significance for me of this, and why I've put it in as a case study, is that it's an open air site, so it's not occurring within a dynamic landscape. <coughs> but rather they are constructing um, a dynamic, significant landscape themselves. So uh, the implication of all of this kind of um, perception for Neanderthal behaviors is quite significant. So it allows us to transcend uh, just functional interpretations of these sites and really consider the uh, interest intricacy of um, previous uh, Neanderthal behaviours. Um, palimpsests of memory, therefore, conceptually demonstrate how we can access um, significance of place, cultural memory, and sociocultural behaviours within these societies. And it also perhaps implies that intracite patterns then have agency. Um, they uh, they um, manipulate and uh, kind of constrain um, people's behavior in the past. So to summarize quickly, <laughs> um, we've seen that previous uh, interpretations of intracite patterns only focus on this first block, the functional, and therefore interpretations are limited to just a basic uh, interpretation of site structure. And this doesn't provide us with much information. It's only through the consideration of the sociocultural and behavioural interaction with the sociocultural that we can have a holistic perception of Neanderthal behaviours and truly appreciate this um, within the Middle Paleolithic. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>